Uh, my name is Nola Reed Knaus. I'm the director of the Moravian Music Foundation, uh, and it is a joy to welcome you here to hear my presentation of Moravian Music 101. Please come in. You know, Moravians are widely known for their music. But what happens when you ask a Moravian, what is Moravian music? Very often a Moravian will mumble something about the Easter sunrise service or about a trombone choir or, or maybe even the morning star hymn or something like that. Somebody who's a little more knowledgeable will talk about the earliest sophisticated classical musical culture in colonial America. They'll talk about first, the first known chamber music written in America, the earliest American performance of Haydn's creation, the first string instruments made in this country, and so on and so on. But that feels like random wanderings to the question, what is Moravian music? Moravian Music Foundation is approaching its 60th birthday in 2016, and it's high time we had an answer to that question. If we can't find an answer to the question, what's Moravian music, then maybe we better quit claiming music as something important to the Moravian church if we can't answer that. But I think there is an answer. We'll start with, uh, we'll do this, we'll explore this as sort of a, a nature of a theme and variations, if you will. So here's our introduction. We'll start with a look at the Moravian church. Uh, Moravian musical tradition in America began with the earliest musical settlers in the first half of the 18th century. And here I'm quoting from With Courage for the Future, The History of the Moravian Church Southern Province by Daniel Cruz and Richard Starbuck. And they write, these Moravians were members of a well-established church officially called Unitas Fratrum or Unity of Brethren that by the mid 18th century had already seen almost three centuries of rich experience of religious life. They were spiritual descendants of the Czech priest John Huss who for his attempts at reform was martyred in 1415. 42 years later, in 1457, some of his followers founded a church body consecrated to following Christ in simplicity and dedicated living. This newly constituted church developed a rich and orderly musical and ecclesiastical life in the 15th and 16th centuries, but they were nearly wiped out in the Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 1648. In the 1720s, a few exiles of this religious heritage, along with other seekers after truth, found refuge on the estate of a Saxon nobleman named Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf, there in their village of Hernhut, and this is a view of Hernhut, Germany. Uh, the ancient church experienced a rebirth, culminating in a spiritual blessing on August 13, 1727. In a br brief few years, five years, by 1732, that first little village of the renewed Moravian church began sending missionaries to all corners of the world. After establishing work in England, the Moravians sent colonists to America in 1735, but that first settlement in Georgia proved unsuccessful, partly because of war between Protestant England and Catholic Spain in Florida, more permanent work was established in Pennsylvania in 1741 with the town of Bethlehem as their chief center. This is a view of Bethlehem from a 1757 painting, 16 years after the founding of the community. Other settlements in Pennsylvania followed and the Moravians purchased 100,000 acres in North Carolina, settling at Bethabara in 1753 with their central town of Salem being founded in 1766. This is a 1787 view of Salem. Notice how hilly the terrain is. You all are very familiar with these hills. From its very beginning, the Moravian Church, the Unitas Fratrum, has kept and preserved careful, meticulous records of church, community, and commercial life. Along with this emphasis on record keeping, the Moravians have always maintained active communication with other Moravian centers in Europe and throughout the world. This continues today throughout the worldwide Moravian unity, which now consists of 21 provinces and a number of other mission provinces and mission areas with about a million members worldwide. So there's our introduction with the beginning of the Moravian church. Along with their rich devotional life and missionary fervor, the Moravians maintained a high regard for education, 
and a love for music as an essential part of life. Moravian composers were well versed in the European classical tradition and they wrote thousands of anthems, solo arias, duets and the like for their worship services, for voices accompanied not only by organ but also by string instruments, uh, woodwinds and brasses. In addition, these musicians copied thousands of works by the best known and best loved European composers of their day. The Stamitz family, Haydn, Abel, Gierowitz, and Mozart, the Bach family, and many others who are hardly known at all today. This collection of music manuscripts and early imprints comprises nearly 10,000 manuscripts and printed works uh, of music with some works appearing in several individual collections. This is the view of the vault of one of the aisles of music in gray boxes in the vault. The collections originating in North Carolina are housed in the Moravian Music Foundation headquarters here in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. We share this building with the Moravian Archives, the historical records of the church, Southern Province. Those originating in Moravian centers in Pennsylvania and Ohio are housed in the Moravian Archives, Northern Province in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. The rich musical life of the Moravians was respected by many in the young country. I mentioned sacred vocal music. They, made, they sang many hymns. There were brass ensembles, especially trombones, serving sociological and liturgical functions, choral and instrumental music for recreation. Recent studies on Moravian music are bringing new insights into the Moravian contribution to the music of America. Uh, there has been assumption over the past, oh, 75 years that the Moravian musical life wasn't really relevant to the rest of the country. Well, that's not quite true. What we have come to find out is that the Moravians knew the latest developments in American music and imported music popular in Europe. Through their educational institutions, they provided music instruction to hundreds of young people from beyond their own communities. What did these students do with what they learned? Where did they go? Whom did they teach? I still wonder if we'll find a connection someday from teacher to student to teacher to student to teacher to student from one of the early Moravian teachers in Salem in the 1780s and somebody like, say, George Gershwin. I don't know that yet, but it's not impossible. <clears throat> so it's time for our theme. Moravian music, past and present, is grounded and rooted, grows and bears fruit within and for the worship of the Savior. That's our theme. That's where our music started. That's where it still thrives. From the earliest years of the Moravian church, the Moravians' passion for Christ rules every aspect of their lives. According to the Moravians, life wasn't divided into separate realms of the sacred and the secular. For all of life was to be lived as a liturgy, as a form of worship, and a means of remaining in intimate contact and identification with Jesus. Zinzendorf saw music as the most effective means of communication directly to the heart, and therefore music was an ever-present part of life. Art Freeman's Ecumenical Theology of the Heart, it's a book studying Zinzendorf and his theology, writes that, quote, one of Zinzendorf's most significant contributions was his discovery that the heart may know what the mind cannot understand. The heart may know what the mind cannot understand. So Moravian worship in the 18th century combined a Lutheran sensitivity for liturgy with a pietist spirituality, enriching and enriched by their communal life. This aesthetic nature of the Moravians found its most all-pervasive expression in music. For the Moravians, music is grounded and rooted, grows and bears fruit within and for the worship of the Savior. There's the theme. Variation one. What's the most obvious worship music that there is? It's what the congregation sings. Through hymns, even the most abstract concepts are expressed in down-to-earth, concrete terms. From the earliest Moravian church through the renewal in the 18th century 
and into what I see as a new period of renewal today, the Moravians' passionate devotion to Jesus flows out in thousands of new hymns, both words and music. Ever since the earliest years, hymn singing has been of the utmost importance, and in the 18th century in particular, heavy emphasis was placed on memorization. They wrote at a synod in 1750 that, quote, a congregation of the Savior must be able to sing without a book, for they should live in the matter. One passes a hymnal to a stranger. So they were expected to know hundreds of hymns by memory. This is a typical page from the 1778 German language Moravian hymnal. Uh, this is a copy owned by Moravian pastor, teacher, composer, and Bishop Johannes Herbst. And the fun thing about this are the things that he wrote in the margins. The little black numbers, there's little red numbers, and there's handwriting here where he's identifying who are the authors of these hymns. We don't know why he underlined some stanzas and didn't underline others. You'll notice there's no music printed in this hymnal. The Moravians didn't print music in their hymnals from the 18th through most of the 19th century. And in the German uh, province today, only their most recent hymnal includes the music. Uh, you were expected to know those tunes. <clears throat> the Moravians' most characteristic worship service was the Singstunde, S-I-N-G-S-T-U-N-D-E, the Singstunde, or singing hour, a service composed entirely of congregational hymn singing. In the Singstunde, the leader would carefully select and order hymn stanzas from a number of different hymns in order to convey some theme or aspect of Christian life and faith. The leader would begin singing, and the congregation would recognize that hymn, words and music, and join in and sing that verse. Then the leader would begin singing another verse of another hymn, perhaps, and they'd join in and sing. So you would sing for 45 to 50 minutes. And throughout that service, you would develop the theme, and it would become clear in your heart what was going on and what Christian truth you were to be learning from and celebrating that day. Hymn singing was considered to be the most important means of communicating and expressing, expressing spiritual truth. Um, Zinzendorf, in fact, measured the health of a congregation not by the power of the preaching, but by the participation and enthusiasm of congregational song, saying that if a congregation's singing ever began to falter, one needed to look to the spiritual life of that church. Moravians today are still writing hundreds of new uh, hymns and worship songs. One of our Advent and Christmas favorites is well, considering the whole history of the Moravian Church, it's relatively new. The music is 19th century, late 19th century, uh, by J. Frederick Wola, the uh, Bethlehem Moravian musician and founder of the Bethlehem Bach Choir. Um, the text originally was written by a bishop of the early unity in Bohemia in the 16th century. This is Once He Came in Blessing. Once he came in are one means through which Moravian music thrives in worship. Variation two is the anthems, the solos, the vocal duets. The incorporation of newly composed pieces into the services for festival days is the basis of what many people think of when they think of Moravian music. 
Moravian pastor and administrator Christian Greger, born in 1723, died in 1801, is credited with introducing anthems and solos with orchestral accompaniment into Moravian worship in the middle of the 18th century. Oh. And this, yes, that's Brother Christian Greger. Looks like somebody you'd like to know. Over the next hundred years, Moravian composers, who were also most often pastors and teachers, wrote thousands of sacred vocal works, mostly accompanied by strings and occasional wind instruments for worship services. <coughs> Moravian composer and admissionist, ad, mission administrator Christian Latrobe characterized Moravian anthems in 1811 as follows, and Latrobe writes, it will be easily perceived that neither in the vocal nor instrumental parts any attempt is made to exhibit the skill of the performers by a display of extraordinary powers of execution which might lead the attention of the congregation into an improper channel. More elaborate compositions are reserved for exercise at home. What Brother Latrobe was saying is that there's no room for showing off in Moravian music. Music and its proper place of worship was of great concern in the 18th century Moravian church. Colin Podmore discusses in his book, The Moravian Church in England, 1728 to 1760, the music in Moravian worship services was known to be beautiful. And the fear arose that many strangers were coming for the music's sake and not seeking the savior. After much discussion, the congregation resolved to discontinue any music other than hymns for the present, because that music was probably attracting many strangers. Also of note is that the fact that for Easter of 1778, the elders conference here in Salem chose not to go to the graveyard for the Easter sunrise service as was customary, and they wrote in the diary, we did not go on account of so many visitors. After most of the visitors had gone home, we held our Easter liturgy in the Zal at three o'clock in the afternoon in the blessed peace of God. <laughs> so while music was considered to be of great significance in Moravian worship, they were careful not to let it become of essential importance and never ever to be a marketing tool. Moravian anthems of the 18th and 19th century share these characteristics. They're based upon biblical or hymn texts, often the daily text assigned for the day of the first presentation of the work. The voice parts tend to move together so that the words are clearly understood rather than any kind of imitative writing would do. In this way, the Moravians resemble, say, Handel more than they resemble Bach. They often have elaborate instrumental introductions and interludes but when the voices are singing, the instrumental parts provide support rather than drawing attention away from the voices. And they are well-crafted, straightforward works that share those kind of characteristics with other Moravian arts and crafts. Moravian composers were certainly aware of their musical gifts and accomplishments, but their own personal memoirs, their Lebensläufe, show that they were careful to keep them under control. Jeremias Denka, 1725 to 1795, composer of perhaps the first instrumentally accompanied sacred vocal works written in America, makes reference only to his organ playing in his own memoir, not to his composition. Uh, several other composers only make minor reference to their musical activities, even though they were very prolific composers. Johann Friedrich Peter, perhaps one of the most prolific and accomplished of the Moravian composers in America, makes two references to music in his own life story. One is a statement of thanksgiving to Jesus for blessing the use of his musical gifts. And the other is an ambiguous passage in which he praises the Lord for bringing him through a difficult period of temptation because he was wrestling with his musical gift. He recognized that musical accomplishments were a talent that was valued by the world and he was wondering if he was writing for the wrong reasons. I personally feel like he must have come up with the answer that no, he really was writing for the glory of God because I think if he'd thought he was writing for his own glory, he'd have quit writing. And he wrote things after he'd written that passage in his memoir. So, The Moravians believed that musical ability, like every other gift, was to be used in praise of the Lord and for the good of the community, not for the benefit of the individual. 
Music is rooted and thrives within the context of the liturgical life of the community in worship. Our example to listen to here is an anthem by Johannes Herbst, None Among Us Lives to Self. music. Of course, you'd expect to hear about organ music in any study of Moravian music and worship. The Moravians did indeed build beautiful organs and use them in worship in accompanying hymn singing and in the ensemble that accompanied the anthems and vocal solos. But one of the factors in Moravian music that I find most understandable and which many who come to study Moravian music find most mystifying is the lack of solo music for organ in the 18th and 19th century Moravian church. This follows directly upon what we found in regard to the sacred vocal music. Musical ability, like every other gift, was to be used in the praise of the Lord and for the good of the community, not for the benefit of the individual. So Christian Latrobe, I've mentioned him before as a composer and mission administrator, he was brought up short by no less than Bishop Spangenberg, one of our grandfathers of the church, regarding the complexity and the artistry of the interludes that he, Brother Latrobe, played between verses and between lines of the hymns in Holy Communion. Brother Spangenberg's counsel, which basically amounts to Humor an old man who doesn't know about music, drop this artistic interluding noodling around and just play it straight. His counsel changed the course of Moravian organ playing for many years to come. They did use the organ, both within the ensemble accompanying the anthems and to accompany the singing of hymns. And Moravian organ builder David Tannenberg built a large number of organs in the later 18th and early 19th century, including this one in 1800 for the church in Salem, the home church, now restored and in the old Salem Visitor Center. Solo organ music, though, like solo violin sonatas or virtuosic solo soprano arias, might attract the listener's attention away from the worship of God towards admiration of the soloist. So yes, the organist did play a prelude before worship, but the organist was counseled to make it simple and short, something improvised based on a hymn tune that was going to be used during the service. Latrobe did not think it was necessary for Moravian organists to be skilled enough to play complicated preludes. Didn't think it was necessary. So organ students, your hymn accompanying, according to the Moravians, your hymn playing and your anthem accompaniments are far more important than your preludes and postludes. There is, though, a growing body of organ music being written today by living Moravian composers, including Brian Hinkleman, Wade Peoples, Ryan Morrow, Stuart McElroy from uh, Wisconsin, uh, Rebecca Kleintop Owens from Bethlehem, and yours truly. 
So brass music. Yes, people who don't know anything else about the Moravians know that they are big on brass. Since the origins of Herrenhut, Germany, the Moravian town in Germany on Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf's estate, brass music has become an important institution within the Moravian church. In many places, early brass music included various instruments, but exclusive trombone choirs were started in many congregations in the 18th century. This is a set of trombones and the tail end of a cello um, that belonged to the congregation of Genadenhut in Ohio. Um, and yes, I do know that that's not the best German pronunciation of that word. The Germans would pronounce it Gnadenhuten, but the Moravians in Ohio call it Genadenhuten. So. <laughs> Uh, with the invention of valve instruments in the 19th century, many brass choirs opened their ranks to other brass instruments or even to woodwinds. Um, but the playing of music outdoors and even during what seems to be more secular activities emphasizes the Moravian concept that every activity within the life of the community is a liturgical act. In our history, the brass choirs, the trombone choirs, would play to announce the death of a member. They would play to welcome a visitor, visitor to town. They would play to wake you up on your birthday, reports, and of course the word in Germany is aufblasen, to blow them up on their birthday. <laughs> we enjoy the pun of that. Um, so um, we've done a little bit of that, but not so much. We haven't blown too many people up recently. Maybe we should restart that tr tradition. Uh, but playing in the brass choir gives members of the community an important task that some have performed over great lengths of time. At Easter, Easter Sunday morning, the bands will play all around town uh, just after midnight and gather down here for breakfast. There may be 300 to three, 350 band members down here for breakfast. And at that meal, we recognize those who have played in the Easter band for 50 or more years. And there are... 20, 30, 35, 40 people who have played 50 or more years and are still playing. Um, I'm grateful for them, and at least one of them, a couple of them are here. <clears throat> In the 20th century, North American Moravian music festivals, the European Blazer Taga or brass festivals, and the South African brass band festivals have become important events in the life of the church. This is a photo from the Unity Brass Festival, Worldwide Moravian Unity Brass Festival held Last May in Badpol, Germany, uh, there were 350 brass players present, uh, about 60 from South Africa, um, 290 from um, the European continental area, from Denmark, the Netherlands, and Germany, and one from America, me. <laughs> I'm hiding in the alto section somewhere in there. <laughs> The next uh, Unity Brass Festival, by the way, will be held here in Winston-Salem in the summer of 2018. So especially in America, the European Continental Province, and South Africa, the tradition of brass music has remained alive and seems to be, if anything, more important than ever. For so many of us, this is indeed cause for thanksgiving. And we'll listen now to a brass quintet playing tune 115B, how great the bliss to be a sheep of Jesus. musicians to play those anthem accompaniments that we talked about, there had to be instruction for them. We're not born knowing how to play a violin or a flute or a trombone. 
And if you know anything about musicians, and you do, you know we'd rather be playing than not playing. So in addition to anthem accompaniments, the Moravians collected an immense body of what we today would call secular instrumental music for use by the musicians of the community, the Collegium Musicum. This organization, a loose organization of instrumentalists of musicians in the community existed to provide opportunities for recreation and, hinting at our theme again, to improve the skills of the players so that they would make better music in worship. Christian Latrobe again describes the role of instruments in Moravian life and worship like this, writing in 1811. In most of the Brethren's settlements, there is a small band of vocal and instrumental performers composed of persons voluntarily engaging their services. They sometimes meet for practice and on particular occasions enliven the service by the performance of anthems suited to the subjects under contemplation. The practice of instrumental music is recommended by the brethren as a most useful substitute for all those idle pursuits in which young people too often consume their leisure hours. And since its application as an accompaniment and support to the voice is calculated to produce the most pleasing effect, its use in the church has been retained. So instrumental music was a good way to spend time and to keep out of other trouble. Moravian instrumental music collections then contain some music by Moravian composers, but by far the greater part of the instrumental music was not written by Moravians, but by composers who were the most popular ones in Europe. They had a voracious appetite for new music, collecting, purchasing, and copying everything they could get their hands on. American Moravian music collections contain several thousand pieces of instrumental music. Uh, Included in these collections are the only known copies of some very important works, including four symphonies by J.C.F. Bach, one of Johann Sebastian Bach's sons. This is the violin one part of his symphony in D minor, copied by Johann Friedrich Peter, Moravian composer. This is the only known copy in the world of this piece from that time. It was copied in 1766. And the Moravians prevented, presented European works in performance often quite soon after their composition or publication in Europe, including what may be the first American performance of Haydn's creation. We've long had the performance parts for that 1811 event, but only recently did we acquire from a rare book dealer a copy of the first edition of the printed score owned by Johann Friedrich Peter. See his signature up in the upper corner right there? Um, this was published in 1803. It's not the first printing of that edition, though. Peter's signature is dated January 1807, and throughout the score, he's made some annotations that seem to be instructions for a copyist. Uh, this may indicate that those parts were copied even before 1811, when that first American performance of the creation is thought to have taken place. Yes, there's more research to do here. What the Moravians then have in their instrumental music collection is a cross-section of the larger musical culture out of which the masters arose, the Haydn's, the Mozart's, the Beethoven's. Many of these early works are the only known surviving copies, as I said. Moravian contributions to the instrumental works are, are significant. Delightful examples are David Moritz Michael's Woodwind Parthian, or Suites, these were written before outdoor performances in Bethlehem and Nazareth, Pennsylvania. There is David Moritz Michael, and a pencil sketch. Uh, and we'll listen to one movement, to a movement of his Parthia number no. six. Thank you. 
that, but I want to move on to more instrumental music. There are a few string works by Moravian composers in our collections. John Antes wrote a set of three string trios, which are lovely and challenging. Antes was born in Pennsylvania, served the Moravian church as a missionary in Egypt. In addition to the trios that we do have, there's a set of, st of string quartets that he wrote that are missing. I hope we find them someday. But to give you an idea of the truly international scope of the Moravian church then as well as now, here we are with these quartets. They were, they were written by an American-born missionary serving in Egypt. He sent copies of the quartets to Benjamin Franklin, American diplomat, then serving in France. And Antes had written these quartets for an English nobleman and his associates living in India. Yes, American born, serving in Egypt, sending copies to an American diplomat in France, quartets he'd written for an English nobleman and his associates in India. Oh my goodness, makes me dizzy. So, uh, by the way, uh, Antes dedicated his three string trios to the Swedish ambassador in Constantinople. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> also, uh, there's Brother Antes. Also, uh, by a Moravian composer of the six string quintets by Johann Friedrich Pater. They were written here in Salem in January of 1789. Peter was probably our most gifted and accomplished composer, and in addition to these quintets, he wrote nearly a hundred vocal works. So we'll listen to a little bit of his string quintet number two, the Presto Asai. <laughs> Yes, that was just the first half. Those of you who were listening carefully know that we ended in the dominant key. So, <laughs> variation six, musical education. If you've got this huge commitment to making music through all of your life, somehow it's got to be taught. All students in Moravian schools received a thorough grounding in vocal music. Children in school sang hymn tunes and chorales as part of their instructional program. They were encouraged to learn to play instruments, including keyboards, winds, and strings. 
Both boys and girls received this basic musical education. In general, though, the girls studied keyboard and some string instruments. The boys studied organ and wind instruments as well, filling the continuing need for organists and orchestral players for worship. The women in the 18th century and early 19th century played instruments in their choir houses or at home, but not, as far as we know, in public. I think this is because the Moravians were very careful in how they allowed the two genders to associate with one another socially, and anybody who doesn't think that sharing a music stand as a social activity was never in a junior high school band. <laughs> music used for instruction in Moravian communities included both secular and sacred music. American patriotic songs, for example, as well as arrangements of British folk songs and dances, songs from the British theater, arias from operas, you name it, they used it in their instruction. The instructors at these Moravian schools in the 18th and 19th century, mostly Moravian clergy, made use of selected aspects of the musical culture of the young country, rejecting neither the values of their faith nor the things they saw as both useful and good from beyond their own borders. So the Moravians lived somewhat isolated, but they did not keep their doors closed and their minds closed to what was going on in the outside world. We've had six variations, and now we do an interlude. You know, in the classical era, theme and variations, every, every theme and variations has its sort of minor section. Later on in the 19th century, the theme and variations sort of piece included a digression. Something, the theme might be turned upside down, as in uh, Rachmaninoff's variations on a theme of Paganini. Maybe the theme is so drastically distorted that you hardly recognize it anymore. We might be stretching our image just a little bit far, but it seems like this is something like the fate of classical Moravian music in the later 19th century. Moravian music and culture, as it was in the late 18th and early 19th century, couldn't survive through the social and cultural changes of the later 19th century. Throughout Europe and North America in particular, consciousness of national identity supplanted the Moravians' earlier focus on their international unity. Moravians in America made conscious choices to conform to their neighbors to become more an American denomination than an international unity. By the middle of the 19th century, English became the language of worship. And as we have come to recognize, many of the later 18th and early 19th century translations of the German hymns lack the vigor and passion of their German originals. Some of them were watered down to be uh, more, shall we say, politically correct. Um, and we're looking now at some of our favorite hymns and going back to what the originals really said and going, hmm, that is interesting. As the American Moravian communities became more receptive to non-Moravian residents, attitudes towards worship changed as well. In the 18th century, church authorities resisted music's appeal to visitors, fearing that the visitors were coming for the sake of the music, not for worship. By the end of the 19th century, there were voices calling to use music for the very purpose of attracting the people. Francis Florentine Hagen, wonderfully colorful characteristic character. He was especially concerned about the continuing use of the German chorales in 19th century America, writing in 1893, and he writes, by forcing upon English-speaking American churches foreign tunes which but few are able to sing properly, we estrange from our services the very people among whom God has placed us to work. Need we wonder at our stunted growth? Brother Hagen was advocating for the use of um, what in that day would have been called contemporary Christian music, gospel songs. And we did adopt some of those. We did bring some of them in throughout our whole heritage, our whole 560 years now, 500 and almost 60 years. We have brought in things from the contemporary culture and added them to our repertoire. Fewer sacred vocal works were being written by Moravian composers in America from the second quarter of the 19th century on. Uh, it was possible to buy music. And alongside the shift from German to English as the common tongue, more published music in English and in the current musical styles was readily available. Musical tastes were changing, moving from classical ideals and expressions toward romanticism, a movement with ideals largely incompatible with the ideals of Moravian worship and life. 
The Romantic composers emphasized individual expression. The Moravians, communal life. The Romantics wrote longer melodies, experimented with harmony and rhythm, and went to extremes of lengths and musical forces from the miniature to the gargantuan. The Moravians preferred balance and symmetry. Some Moravian composers were able to live with a foot in both worlds. Brother Hagen's anthems show his classical training and his Moravian heritage, while his solo songs, piano works, and organ works show the influence of Romanticism. It appears, however, that most of our composers simply adopted the musical preferences of their neighbors, packing the old manuscripts away, composing fewer works of their own. Outside of formal worship, attitudes shift, shifted in the community's musical life as well. The Collegium Musicum, the musicians of the community, became the Philharmonic Society. Uh, the emphasis moving from music made by members of the community for their own enjoyment and for musical training for worship to music performed by professionals in public concerts. While the number of participants grew, the musical presentations changed in character and philosophy. One's musical accomplishments were seen perhaps as more important than one's membership in the community of faith. No longer was all of musical life to be lived as a liturgy, as worship. In America, community bands and orchestras certainly benefited from the Moravians' musical accomplishments and those of the graduates from Moravian schools, but these organizations were not necessarily connected to the Moravian church and not subjected to church oversight. The increase during the 19th century in the number of publications of pieces by Moravians is also evidence of this changing focus. Very few compositions by 18th century Moravian composers were published or known at all beyond Moravian communities. In the 19th century, Moravian composers were no longer writing solely for their own congregations or solely for worship. Works for voice and piano, piano solo, organ, and to a lesser extent, choir, were published in such places as New York and Philadelphia. By the later 19th century, Moravian composers in America were no longer content to write just for themselves and their near neighbors, but were competing with mainstream American composers. A few Moravian musical highlights in the later 19th century can be celebrated. One of these is the result of the confluence of two traditions, the Moravian brass music tradition and the growing popularity of, communi of community brass bands and the invention of the valve for brass instruments. The result for us was the Civil War Band of the 26th North Carolina Regiment, uh, whose music survives in our holdings as the only known complete set of music of a Confederate band. Their music includes marches, polkas, quick steps, waltzes, ballads, ours, areas from operas, of course, Moravian chorales, and one of my favorites that we'll listen to, the Mockingbird Quick Step.
And it goes on into another tune, but again, we don't have time to listen to it all. That's uh, played by the American Brass Quintet, Brass Band, uh, faculty members and friends of the Juilliard School of Music, recorded in 2001. Among those who wrote music for the 26th Regimental Band were the Van Fleck sisters of Salem, Miss Amy, Miss Lou, and Miss Lisetta. These three gifted women all taught at Salem Female Academy, now Salem Academy and College, in the later 19th and early 20th century. All three of them were accomplished musicians and composers, and their piano and vocal works recently recorded show their musical ability. And uh, Dr. Rothrock was just reminding me that today is the 100th anniversary to the day of a tragic accident that took Miss Lissetta's life. Uh, she was, uh, there was a fire in her home. Uh, and she died. So that's her, her death date was 100 years ago today, September 19th, 1914. But let's listen for a minute to the River Waltz, uh, recently recorded by Professor Lustersing. <laughs> Barbara, aren't you glad you didn't have to play from that manuscript? <laughs> uh, we have just recently recorded the collected known works of Miss Amy and Miss Lisetta von Fleck on a two CD set called A Loving Home's a Happy Home, and it is something we're extremely proud of. 20th century was marked by the rediscovery of the richness and breadth of the musical life of the early American Moravians. Uh, this rediscovery was accomplished largely by musical scholars who weren't really associated with the Moravian church. But they discovered, they studied Moravian music as 
previously unknown evidence that there was a highly sophisticated musical culture even in the backwoods of early America. So the music of the Moravians did get to be known, but in concert performances with an emphasis on professional performance, rather than by Moravians making music for our own love and for our own joy. Moravian music was placed on the concert stage. Audiences were sought from concert goers and music critics. And the reviews, some of the reviews have been uneven over the years because the reviewers were looking at Latrobe trying to compare him to Haydn rather than comparing Latrobe to Latrobe. So our job yet is to come up with a way to interpret Moravian music fairly for what it is and for what it is not. Finale. You wondered if we were ever going to get to the finale. What happens in a finale of a theme in variations? You bring in motives from a bunch of the other variations and you wrap it all up in a fairly neat package but sometimes there are a few loose ends for further development later on. Some of the codas in theme and variations have as much new music in them as, as development of the pre-existing themes. Music of the American Moravians is a tradition of composition and performance that is extraordinarily well documented due to the investment of the Moravian church over five and a half centuries in preserving its history. Only within the last 75 years has this musical heritage attracted significant scholarly interest. And in keeping with the, heritage, with the commitment to its heritage as a gift from God, the church and many of its members individually have continued to support this, mu this research through the Moravian Music Foundation. Now that we're in the 21st century, many scholars are coming to a new appreciation of the true merits of the music of the Moravians, seeking to understand this music within its intended context. Within the past 15 years, there has been a resurgence of interest in Moravian music upon, among scholars on the European continent as well. One might hope that this new interest may well continue in the direction it has begun towards consideration of the music of the Moravians in its proper context of music within a life of worship. This hope is based on my joyful observation that in recent years many members of the Moravian Church have also shown a new interest in their own heritage of music and worship. There have been over the past 64 years 24 Moravian music festivals, each including seminars and workshops geared towards music in today's Moravian Church, as well as topics in historical musicology. The 25th Moravian Music Festival will take place in Winston-Salem in the summer of 2017. Other conferences sponsored by the Moravian Church have begun to explore how the Moravian heritage of music and worship can enrich today's worship and outreach as deep roots enable new growth. Research into such divergent areas as Moravian missions, women's memoirs, industry, theology, horticulture, relationships with Native Americans, relationships between Europeans and African Americans, new translations of diaries, correspondence, discourses and hymns, new relationships among Moravian musicians from America, Europe, and South Africa and Labrador all have become resources not only for scholars but also for persons in the pew to rediscover their own heritage. So here we are again. What is Moravian music? Most of the discussion of the music of the Moravians so far has been in the past tense. While the multitude of daily and weekly worship services of the 18th century Moravian church hasn't survived the transition to modern social and community life, we can celebrate that many aspects of Moravian worship and devotional life do continue. Moravian love feast and service of Holy Communion continue to reflect their roots in the 18th century Zingstunde. The Zingstunde itself continues in many congregations, especially in Germany, where the Saturday evening's uh, weekly Zingstunde is something to look forward to. Hymn stanzas for the Zingstunde are still selected to communicate the theme, but where the 18th century Moravians would have sung by memory, today they're handed a card listing the selected hymn numbers and stanzas. It sticks out of the back of the side of their hymnal and they start singing and go straight down the list. 
<clears throat> Let us rejoice then that the hymnody of the Moravian Church continues to thrive with its preservation of hymns of the past, new translations of old hymns, and the addition of many new expressions of faith. <clears throat> In fact, new band books. We published new set of books for the Moravian bands in 2006, uh, does not replace the old band books, but added 200 new tunes to our repertory. So the bands now have a repertory of some 400 tunes to choose from, and people keep asking me when we're going to bring out the next one. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, we are publishing Moravian anthems. Um, at the rate of eight or ten a year, we have become our own publisher because commercial publishers really didn't want to have anything to do with us. We don't sell enough copies. So the Moravian Music Foundation is its own publisher. Approximately 650 Moravian anthems from the 18th and 19th centuries have been published within the last 60 years. In, and we are also publishing newly written anthems by living Moravian composers. The organist in Moravian worship retains a position of significant worship leadership. Very few Moravian congregations in America employ a full-time director of music or organist, uh, but most maintain high expectations of the organist, not as a solo recitalist, but rather as a sensitive hymn player and a leader of congregational singing. Uh, organ students, if you get a chance to play in a Moravian church, you'll learn lots of tunes you'll never play anywhere else. They will become a part of your life and heart. So don't miss the opportunity. Many Moravians still sing in four-part harmony, whether or not they read music. Uh, they grow up improvising alto and tenor parts on lifelong familiarity with the hymn tunes. Uh, the church bands continue. This is the church band from Raleigh Moravian Church. Uh, in 2008. Uh, you'll notice a wide variety of ages, um, from the very young to the not so young. Uh, the um, emphasis remains on ensemble playing of chorales, but there are some other, uh, other instrumental music is added in. Some of the bands do play concert music as well. And the emphasis remains on ensemble playing. Uh, the only wind instrument that I tend to discourage from a Moravian band is a piccolo because it's a solo sound. It cuts through the top. And I, I, I don't like that in the Moravian band. I'd rather just keep the, the ensemble sound as a whole. I'm a, and by the way, I'm a flutist and piccolo player. So, <laughs> The church band in many congregations plays at the graveside for funerals. You'll hear them here often. Uh, they play indoor or outside before, before special services, festival services. The band accompanies the procession to the graveyard, God's Acre, for Easter dawn services. Wherever Moravians gather for conferences or provincial synods or festival occasions, a band is often assembled from among the participants. And certainly ensembles consisting solely of trombones have not disappeared from Moravian life. There's the Salem Con Trombone Choir that uh, Dr. Rothrock conducts. There is a trombone, Bethlehem area Moravian Trombone Choir that's been going on for, oh, 260 years now. There is a trombone choir in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and Downey, California. So there's at least four American Moravian trombone choirs that I know of. I'm sitting here looking at my trombonists in the back of the room. They're not coming up with anything else. With these as examples of the continuation of Moravian musical heritage, it becomes clear that throughout most of our history, the Moravian music has maintained an admirable consistency of purpose. From the very beginning, congregational participation was an essential part of Moravian worship. Hymn singing by the congregation was carefully nurtured. Musical training is an essential part of education. In retrospect, it might seem that not all specially gifted Moravians were given full scope for the expression of their musical talents, but I don't think any of them would say now that they regretted that. They felt they were serving where they were called to serve. In all cases, the musical gift took second place to the more important work of spreading the gospel. Two stories serve to illuminate the essence of Moravian music. Around 1780, a visitor to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, wrote that he was, quote, astonished with the delicious sounds of an Italian concerto. 
but my surprise was still greater on entering a room where the performers turned out to be common workmen of different trades playing for their amusement. Two aspects of this experience are notable. First, the quality of the music he heard, and second, the identity and purpose of the performers. Some two and a quarter centuries later, in 2004, during a presentation at an international trombone and brass festival, celebrating the 250th anniversary of the Bethlehem Trombone Choir, the members of the choir introduced themselves. Some of their members were absent, but those who were present included a computer consultant who was also an official scorer for Major League Baseball, a retired pastor, a church sexton, a chemical technician, a small business owner, a software developer, and a retired accountant. None of them had music as his or her primary occupation. This venerable Moravian musical institution, 250 years Bethlehem Trombone Choir, depends on amateurs, not professionals, for its continuation. So this, then, is the core of the Moravian musical heritage. As a gift of God, music is the language of the heart and of the mind in worship. As a people's expression of faith, music is worthy of great care and effort, including proper education, training, preparation, and leadership. Music, however, is not the purview of a few specially gifted professionals who are hired to perform while everybody else listens in awe. Music is the purview of the entire community of faith. Educated musicians are welcomed and in fact needed, but all are invited and expected to participate and the focus is on the music of the people at worship, not on the accomplishments of the few. I would submit that if the Moravian musical heritage ever depends upon hired professionals for its continuation, then it's already dead and the Moravian church may not be far behind it. You know, the transitions and uncertainties of this life in this new century remind me of the history of Central Europe following the Thirty Years' War into the 18th century. In the face of the challenges of that time, refugees from the ancient Moravian church found a new home, renewed their church, began a worldwide mission endeavor, created a musical culture that helped to form their identity and to carry that identity and mission to new lands. They could do that then. What are we going to do now? Moravian musicians today would be well advised to know their heritage, study their traditions, and seek new expressions of faith within and beyond those traditions. Musicians and scholars seeking to learn more about the music of the Moravians would be well advised to get to know the history, theology, and life of the Moravian community and study this musical culture within its known own natural habitat. For all of us, it's crucial to, to recognize that for the Moravians, music is part of living life as a liturgy, of living worship. All of the people are musicians, and the audience is God. We'll close by listening to an anthem not by a Moravian composer, by Ernst Wilhelm Wolff, um, who was, is born in 1735, died in 1791, but uh, the Moravians loved his music, and there's a great many of his pieces in our collections, and it brings out the joy of the Moravian musical life.
thank you for coming today. If you are looking for research topics uh, at any point or internships or anything else, we can certainly assist you. Thanks very much. Go in peace. Have a good weekend.